Okay, so welcome everybody. So we are ready to start uh, this uh, seminar, part of the Y series. There will be two speakers today talking about uh, high order spectral modeling. So uh, the first one will be Professor Guillaume Ducrozet from the Cos Central de Nantes that will provide an overview of high order sp spectral modeling and the limitation and capability. And the second speaker will be Cree Decord from Parkwind that will show an application of the um, fluid and uh, structure, structure, increased structure response. Uh, sorry, Gigi Scavalleri is coming to join the seminar with us. And so please, uh, Guillaume, you can start. Yes, thanks a lot, Alvise. So we'll share my screen. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. So thanks a lot for being here and thanks a lot for the organizer, Alvise Tan, for inviting me to provide this uh, yeah, small speech about uh, high order spectral method and what uh, we have done in past years about the development of such kind of model and to provide you a kind of overview of yeah, capabilities like uh, Alvise was saying. Uh, so my, uh, so I'm professor in uh, Ecole Centrale Nantes, uh, so in the LIA lab, which is a joint research unit between uh, Central Nantes and CNRS, uh, located in France. So uh, my lab is mostly interested in uh, wave structure interactions. Uh, so we are doing some different studies about sea keeping, maneuvering uh, of floating or fixed objects where we are mostly interested in yeah, studying the behavior of such kind of uh, floating objects subject to waves. So here it's an example of a floating offshore wind turbine here, which is a, uh, it's a spar platform, which is subject to uh, waves in our wave tank. So this is, let's say, the main topic of research we are addressing in, uh, in my university, in my lab. Uh, but in order to understand the behavior of such kind of object, it's very important to have a knowledge about waves and how the waves are propagating. And this is why we have put a lot of efforts in uh, developing numerical models and uh, doing some uh, analysis of uh, wave physics on different topics that I will uh, briefly provide you an overview uh, today. Um, so, okay, my talk is mostly dedicated to the description of the HOS model and to the recent development in order to try to overcome some of the limitations of the original HOS model. And if I have time, I will present you a few applications uh, to ocean engineering, but uh, after grit, we'll uh, probably uh, discuss about this in uh, more details. Um, so the high order spectral model uh, is based on potential flow formalism. So this is classical way of approximating the wave physics. So meaning that we have an incompressible flow, a rotational flow on non-viscous fluid. So this means that inherently you cannot model any wave breaking with such kind of model. So this is why you describe the free surface elevation with a single valued function like this. And you have the classical uh, Laplace equations to solve inside your free domain. So the set of equations that you need to solve is uh, quite, let's say, classical Laplace equation in the domain on after different boundary conditions. Kinematic free surface boundary condition, dynamic free surface boundary condition, and the boundary condition on the bottom. So this is a classical, what we call, fully non-linear potential flow uh, formalism, and you have a huge number of uh, numerical solvers that can solve this set of equations, and the higher the spectral model is just one of them, of several of them with their different pros and cons, but I will try to present you uh, why it might be interesting when you do some wave studies to study, to use a higher the spectral method. So the high order spectral method. So if we do, uh, let's say a bit of history, actually it was originated in the late eighties. And actually it's developed in uh, Central Nantes since the beginning of 2000. So it's quite long history. And we have uh, delivered an open source version of the high order spectral methods uh, in 2015. Uh, on the solver, here solve for the wave propagation. So here it's a classical picture of what we are solving. So we have a given um, uh, special domain and we 
give an initial free surface elevation and uh, we let it evolve in time and we can study what's happening inside this uh, sea state. So with a domain which is rectangular over a flat, a flat bottom. Uh, so what is inside this high order spectral model? So the high order spectral model, uh, after a bit of uh, a slight variable change, uh, the problem is written in terms of surface quantities, which is the free surface elevation I introduced previously, as well as the free surface velocity potential, which is this phi tilde here. So with this change of variable, actually you obtain a system where all the unknowns are surface quantities on the free surface. So this means that in terms of numerical uh, method, you only need to do a discretization on the free surface. So this is very advantageous in terms of number of unknowns. And after, if you look at the free surface boundary condition written this way, um, so uh, in order to advance in time those two quantities, those two unknowns, you need to be able to solve what is on the right hand side of those two free surface boundary conditions. And actually, all the work of the higher the spectral model is to obtain this W, which is the only non explicit uh, variable that you have in this equation, which is the vertical velocity at the free surface. So when we speak about high order spectral model, the high order spectral model, this is to find an efficient way to compute the vertical velocity at the free surface when you know the velocity, the velocity potential at the free surface and the free surface elevation. Yeah. So without going into uh, detail, this high order spectral model. So here, this is the original developers of the, of the approach. So uh, HOS method solve this uh, vertical velocity in an efficient way, and the main idea behind the, the methodology, I do not show all equations here, this is that we replace uh, the Dirichlet -like problem we have on z equal to eta, which is an unknown, is replaced by an iterative solution, where instead of having one complicated problem expressed on an uh, unknown location z equal to eta, we replace it with a set of different directly problems written on the undisturbed free surface. Yeah. And the main advantage of the model is that this iterative solution, you can stop or do the development up to an arbitrary order m. So this order of development that you use to simplify this uh, directly problem on z equal to eta is referred as the order of nonlinearity on this one arbitrary parameter, meaning that you can stop the iterative development where you want in order to achieve the accuracy you are interested in. So what is important to keep in mind is that you have a new parameter, which is this order of nonlinearity, which is one numerical parameter you can play with in terms of accuracy. Uh, and efficiency. So in the HOS method, once you obtain this vertical velocity, you can advance in time the, the two unknowns with classical Runge-Scutta scheme. We use in uh, HOS Ocean adaptive time steps, but it's, let's say, kind of classical. So this HOS method, uh, in terms of uh, numerical discretization, spatial discretization, it's using a pseudo-spectral solution. So this is what is making the method uh, very attractive in terms of computational efforts. So this means that all quantities are expressed on a spectral basis, uh, which means that some operations that you need to do are done in the spectral space. So when we speak about spectral space here, this is a development in, uh, in the spatial domain. So when uh, we speak in higher the spectral mo model of modes, these are spatial modes, not temporal modes. And those spatial modes, a n or b n, here can evolve in time due to nonlinearities. Um, so since we use uh, this expression in spectral basis, we are kind of constrained in terms of geometry to rectangular domains that allows us to use fast Fourier transform to go from a physical spatial domain to transform a spectral domain. Yeah. So all uh, uh, derivatives in space are done in, spa in spectral domain because it's very efficient and all multiplications in space are done in spatial domain and you go from one space to the other using fast Fourier transform that ensures the efficiency of the method. So if we kind of uh, summarize the main advantages is that this model takes into account high degree of nonlinearity on the vista 
degree of nonlinearity is arbitrary and it's just one parameter in the method. You can go wherever you want in terms of HOS order here. And uh, <clears throat> I would say that probably the most interesting part is that you have a very fast solution thanks to the use of both fast Fourier transform that allows you to have an efficient solution uh, thanks to the high accuracy also of spectral methods in terms of convergence properties that I will just show you uh, some example after. Um, so if I show a few, uh, few ideas about what you can solve in such kind of high order spectral model, where we study ocean wave propagation. So first I uh, show you just some very basic uh, validation uh, test where what you can do is to just propagate a regular wave, nonlinear regular wave that you propagate in time. So what I just wanted to uh, insist on is what is on the top right uh, plot, where what is de depicted here, this is the error in the evaluation of the vertical velocity. So if you uh, understood what I told you, the only, let's say, approximations that you do in the high order spectral method, this is to evaluate this vertical velocity. And the error in this vertical velocity here is depicted as function of the number of spatial points you have in your domain, as well as the HOS order I introduced previously. And what is very interesting, thanks to the pseudo-spectral method, is that if you look at the error, here it's the log of error. So here you have an exponential convergence with respect to the number of spatial points, so very fast convergence due to pseudo-spectral method. And the order of nonlinearity, you also have an exponential convergence or so linear, linear line here as a function of this order of nonlinearity. So this means that you can use a reduced number of points, reduce HOS order, and to achieve a very nice accuracy thanks to the model. So this is what is kind of ensuring the efficiency of the model. And since this is a highly nonlinear model, what you can play with is to study different physical phenomena that we have uh, done in the past. I can just show you an example. So you can study uh, modulational instability, Benjamin Fair instability. You can even study the instability with a uh, higher order of nonlinearity, what we call five wave instability, which is this classical uh, crescent wave pattern. So I don't know if you see the video, but uh, here it's a uh, propagating wave, so it's a regular wave with a very small perturbation in the transverse direction. So it's an old video, but uh, I, I just show it to you because I recovered it recently, uh, where you see that due to high degree of nonlinearity, so five wave interactions, you have this formation of crescent waves or horseshoe patterns on the free surface due to this high order uh, nonlinear interactions here. So you have this feature of horseshoe pattern that appears here. And in order to be able to model such kind of phenomena, you need a high order of fully nonlinear model that HOS is able, able to do. So after, once you have the model, for sure, what you can play with is to play with the model to study the propagation of uh, C states. So since the model is very efficient in, in, uh, in terms of computational effort, it's actually accessible to study quite large domain, let's say of the order of 10 or 100 of square kilometer during long time on a, a typical computer architecture. Here it was maybe using uh, 32 CPUs here in order to study such kind of domain with very broad banded C state or more narrow banded C state. And the idea is that, okay, you can, to all studies associated to waves that you might be interested in using the model. So on the top part, for instance, what is represented is the temporal evolution of the spectrum. So here it's a spectrum in wave number space. Initially, you give uh, something like a John Swap spectrum here, which is a directional spectrum. And you see that due to nonlinear interactions, uh, you have a very strong broadening of the spectrum due to nonlinear wave interactions on which is mostly happening along the line where you have a strong modulational instability or Benjamin Fair instability. So this is the kind of study that you can do with the, with the model. So I have worked uh, also quite a lot in uh, looking at uh, extreme waves appearance. So since you have the model, you give an initial free surface elevation and you can study 
when do you have uh, an extreme wave in your uh, in your model and to identify the the shape of those waves when do they appear in the computational domain or to study whatever you are interested in so this is a classical way uh, we have or i have used it uh, in the past and uh, what i can say is that the higher dose spectral model i would say that now it has been uh, it's quite typical in the nonlinear water wave community. A lot of people are using it. Uh, it has been highly validated and it has been used to study several types of different nonlinear phenomena. And uh, I would say it's quite simple from the numerical point of view. But for sure, you have some limitations of the model. I would say that the main limitations come first from the geometry, which is highly constrained because you can study only a rectangular periodic domain with flat bottom. And it's also uh, limited to propagation of nonlinear waves. So if you are interested in uh, adding uh, forcing, dissipation, effect of current, for sure, you need to do some uh, development on this. So I will uh, provide you a few elements about uh, recent work we have done in trying to overcome the limitations of classical higher dose spectral methods. Um, so higher dose spectral method is for sure used uh, as a nonlinear potential flow solver. So you are interested in nonlinear waves. So most of people are interested in strong C state. So the question that you can ask yourself is what is the highest C state that you can model with higher dose spectral method? So if you do, if you just uh, run the code and see when it's working or when it's not working, it's not working in everything which is red, okay? Here it's uh, just a, a graph as function of significant wave height peak period. And for sure, why does it not work here? It's because uh, you have uh, breaking and breaking cannot be modeled with such kind of uh, nonlinear potential flow solver. So the question that is asked is how it is possible to take into account the breaking inside potential flow models. Because potential flow models are irrotational non-viscous, so it cannot really simulate the breaking, but you can try to have an approximate of the effect of breaking uh, by using an adequate model. So the idea of accounting for wave breaking in HOS model, the idea is that we use a two-step procedure so first, we identify a wave breaking onset criteria that allows you to say this wave will break in the future. So what we have uh, is a criteria in, in, produced by Barcelemi uh, Banner on uh, co in 2018, which is based on a, kine on a kinetic cre criterion based on the fluid velocity compared to crest velocity. And what we have done after we have done some experiments to validate that uh, this criteria is robust with some experiments in wave tank facilities to identify breaking waves from non-breaking waves. Okay, so we have done this and validate this breaking onset. Once we know which wave will break in the future, what is possible to do is to dissipate energy. So for this, what we have used is to use an eddy viscosity model. So to apply locally, a dissipation, something like a diffusive term in kinetic on the dynamic free surface boundary conditions to remove part of the energy. So we have used the parametrization from the literature. And what we have done is that we have tried to validate this model against experiments. So the experiments that we have carried out were experiments with unidirectional waves. It's a wave tank. You have a wave maker on the right hand side. You generate some waves, so we have tested on different types of waves. So here you see a breaking, and we have different wave gauges inside our tank, and we study the amount of energy before breaking, after breaking, and we compare our numerical simulations with the uh, with the numerical prediction, and it's working very well with the parametrization that we have used. So we are pretty happy with this. But for now, this breaking model is working only for unidirectional waves. Um, if we want to add some additional physical phenomena, we also have developed a model to take into account the propagation of waves over varying bathymetry. Here. For instance, here it's a propagation of uh, di directional seas over an ellipsoid 
uh, submerged ell ellipsoid yeah, that we have also validated against experiments. So it's possible, thanks to HOS, to overcome these limitations of flat bottom. Just as a matter of order of magnitude, the computational efforts to run this case, which is small scale, yeah, it's only something like 15 seconds per wave period. So HOS is really efficient when you have, when you have a limited uh, spatial domain. We also recently uh, developed a version of the HOS model that takes into account the interaction between waves and current and validated also the uh, interactions of counter propagating current on waves and uh, the effect on the extreme waves appearance. So you can, inside the HOS model, do some developments to enhance uh, the capabilities of the model. Uh, on the last, uh, let's say, uh, development that I will uh, present today uh, is the work that we have done in order to try to develop what I call a numerical wave tank based on high order spectral model. So for now, the HOS model I presented to you, what you assume is that you have um, a given domain, which is periodic in space, you give an initial free surface elevation and you let it evolve in time. Okay. We have 20 minutes just yeah. to... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a numerical wave tank, what you have, you have a given uh, something like a swimming pool with some reflective wall and you have a wave maker that is used to generate some waves. So the configuration is very, it's quite different because you start from rest and the waves are generated on one boundary. So what we have done is that we have developed a specific model here to model this numerical wave tank, where the idea is to replicate all specificities of the experimental wave tank in terms of wave generation, absorbing zone, and the tank geometry. You know, so we have really uh, something what we can call a digital twin of our experimental facility that allows us to have validate the model uh, with a large number of different test cases. So I will go uh, briefly, but the different validations we have done are on uh, unidirectional irregular waves, where here is compared HOS with experimental results in our ocean wave basin. So here it's the experimental facility we have in ECN. It's 50 meter long, 30 meter wide, five meter deep. And you have uh, 48 independent paddles that allows you to generate waves. So you can generate 2D regular waves, so focused waves, but you can also generate 3D focused wave. So we can just show you what, uh, so the high order spectral model, you can simulate really what's happening in a wave tank. So it's very useful on, from our point of view, in terms of use of experimental wave tank, we are now always using the uh, numerical wave tank at the same time as the experiments in order either to prepare the experiment or to uh, mitigate the limitations of the experimental wave tank in terms of the size of the tank, the number of wave gauges you can put in your tank or whatever. So this is kind, I think, kind of a nice uh, tool that we can have. Uh, so I will skip the wave structure interactions part because I will be uh, too long, but just uh, one minute on the fact that the high order spectral model that I presented to you, HOS Ocean and HOS NWT, actually has been coupled to some CFD solver to solve the wave structure interactions. Yeah, so we have developed a specific uh, wrapper program that we call the grid to grid uh, that allows you to transfer the information from the high order spectral model to uh, CFD uh, softwares to solve a classical problem of ocean engineering, which is, for instance, a green water problem here, yeah, impact of waves on structure. But for sure, the waves here is solved with HOS and you use a dedicated model to solve the interactions between the waves and the floating object. Yeah. So you can do it with a floating offshore wind turbine or whatever. So if I want to conclude, um, I would say that the high order spectral model is, I would say, now very mature to study uh, wave propagation up to possible large scales. You have open source models available. It's possible to uh, find enhancements with respect to what is the physics that you solve, what is the geometrical uh, configurations. 
But for sure, there is still quite some uh, challenges in uh, terms of wave modeling. I think that the main challenge that is remaining is probably the inclusion of wave breaking models in short crested seas, where nothing exists uh, nowadays. And uh, for the community of uh, WISE that is uh, attending today, probably uh, the additional physical features like wind input or uh, associated dissipation is probably also one direction where we can try to go in order to make the link between uh, what is done from the stochastic point of view with uh, WaveWatch 3 or similar models and what is done from the deterministic point of view with uh, nonlinear models. So thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, probably the Q&A sessions comes after the second talk. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks, William. Thanks very, very. I like the presentation. So any question? So I see one in the meeting chat. There is a Josh Kozal is asking where you can find the animation you are just, you have just shown. So there uh, are, you can interact later, probably. Yeah, you can send me an email. Yeah. Uh, yes, some questions. You can unmute and make directly the question to William. Yeah, Henrik, you are muted. Sorry, uh, thank you. Very nice talk, uh, Guillaume. Just one question about the wave breaking. So um, <clears throat> when do you actually turn off the, um, the dissipation term? How do you determine that? Um, it's uh, in the, the parameterization of the dissipation model gives you um, from the geometry of the breaking of the pre-breaking wave, you can define more or less how much energy you want to dissipate and during how long it will act. Yeah. Mm. But here the main point is that the model that we have used, you only need to you know what is the geometry of the wave prior to breaking. And after everything, you don't need to uh, parameterize any, any, anything. After you are just using the model and it's choosing automatically the length on which it will act, the duration on which it will act. And yeah. it seems to work pretty well on the test case that we have done. Yeah. And the details are in the paper that you... Yeah. Uh, yeah okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Uh, Johannes? Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. I was just curious, can, can this method also deal with bottom friction and also maybe friction around uh, uh, pile structures and things like that? Uh, that was not really mm. clear to me. No, yeah, it's really based on potential flow. So you, if you want to include any bottom friction or other types of uh, viscous phenomena, you need to modify a way or another the existing model. Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay, thanks. Alvise, I think you're muted if you're saying something. I'm muted, sorry. I got the question if you if you have yes, I think we have one more minute. So William, can you please give an overview of what happens to the solution if you don't include the wave breaking? So is there a maximum time for the simulation to run in order to, to have a reliable solution? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say it's very dependent on the on the condition that you study. But what will happen to the code if you don't include any breaking model is that the code will just crash. You know? okay. Because when you since it's based on spectral model, if you start to model a wave which is which becomes vertical here you know, from a decomposition on a series of modes, this means that you need an infinite number of special modes to represent your free surface, you know? meaning that you are putting energy to uh, very high modes you know, on which becomes unstable and the solution just stops. And if you study an irregular C state, it will be okay up to the point where you have the first breaker, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Guyan. I think we can pass the second speaker. Yep. So, Rit, if you can Thank share you. the screen, we stage is yours.
Hi, good afternoon. Can you see my screen, Alfisa? Yes, we can. Perfect. You can start. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for organizing uh, this webinar. Today, I want to talk a bit about uh, some research I did a few years ago, but um, with the work I'm doing now has gotten a little bit of uh, a different meaning. So I'm going to present indeed uh, an application both to HOS and CFD. Okay. So uh, where I'm coming from? Well, at the moment, I'm working for Parkwind. Parkwind is a Belgian uh, developer. We uh, recently became part of uh, the Chera Energy Group, which is a, a big group in, uh, in energy. Um, as a, an independent offshore wind developer until now, uh, Parkwind has been one of the forerunners. And at the moment, we have about one gigawatt uh, of energy available um, within different geographies, but mainly Belgium. So what does a developer do? Well, we develop our projects and basically our wind turbines stay with us until, uh, until the end. So basically until the end of the concession. What's my place in it? Well, I'm a foundation package engineer. So basically, I'm concerned with all questions related to the foundation in a broad sense. Um, I mostly do uh, floating foundations, but I'm also involved with R&D and also basically look at, uh, at many different topics within the team, be it metocean, uh, soil conditions. So basically the whole spectrum with a few specializations, of course. We do a lot of R&D and basically um, one third of my colleagues has a PhD, which is necessary in this industry as um, it's very competitive these days. So starting from an industry conte context, um, basically we're building larger turbines, we're doing so in deeper soil and deeper seas and doing so in the more exposed locations as a result. And that gives us a few challenges as well as opportunities. So basically as our turbines increase, we have seen that throughout time, our wind turbines have become bigger and bigger. So nowadays we're talking about um, 20, 21 megawatts to be reached by 2030. The first turbines for 15, mega, 15 megawatts being built in 25, 26. So the industry is scaling up quite fast, which is a necessity if you look to the uh, national and international frameworks we're working in. You would say at a certain point, people said that, yeah, the 10 megawatt, we already have very big monopiles um, from di diameters up to nine meters, sometimes 10 meters. We cannot go any bigger. Well, indeed, we have gone bigger. Monopiles until 12 meters are being discussed and even up these days. They are not being built yet, but they are being uh, considered as a possibility by our fabricators. However, with increasing wind turbines, we also have seen that there is a downshift in um, a downshift in natural frequencies. So in the ranges we're allowed to uh, design our wind turbines in. So as you can see on my screen, there's uh, normally we have soft stiff towers and we normally design them to be between the rotor frequency and the plate blasting frequency, making sure that they don't undergo excessive excitation due to the uh, motion of the rotor. However, where we formerly were around 0.21 for the 9.5 megawatts, we have now gone down further towards the left of the, of the spectrum. And you see basically that for 15 megawatts, we have gone uh, towards a smaller range of frequencies in which we design our wind turbines, as well as we have gone lower. And this creates some opportunities because this basically means that from a frequency point of view, we can have turbines. We can have turbines that are more slender and more soft than those that were built at 9.5 megawatts. Of course, that's not the entirety of the story, especially as we see from this picture that as we go down, that we go uh, closer towards um, the tail of the wave spectrum. And that gives us some challenges as well, especially if you consider that at the moment we go 
towards, um, yeah, because we can actually build softer structures, we can actually also go to deeper, um, to deeper conditions. And that means that in general, we're more exposed to quite harsh conditions. So as these conditions become harsher, we also see that our teal becomes uh, a bit heavier. Also see that we get higher ULS loads, which have indeed a, a very big impact on our resulting uh, monopile diameters, which again, drive them up. So on the one hand, we have the fact that the design frequencies are lower, but actually we see that in the end, if we build them in more harsher conditions that are more deeper as well, we also see that our uh, DI meters go up again. So um, we are de dealing with harsher wave conditions and therefore notwithstanding the a priori slander structures, which you would expect if you see that the frequencies decrease, we see that we, the wave loads are actually pushing the monopiles to their fabrication limits. And that's kind of a challenge, especially if you consider that, um, um, that um, harsher conditions give, our, give, us, uh, give us certain phenomena that we would not have in more simpler locations, thinking of uh, like the Baltic, where we have built one of our farms, or uh, the Mediterranean. So um, basically, in terms of academic uh, research, I've been looking towards my PhD from a few years ago towards extreme wave loading in random sea states. And that's where I found a few challenges related to monopiles. So basically random sea states, one of the big concerns is that in the industry we still uh, consider for most, um, for most uh, design states, we consider a linear, um, linear wave theory. And basically in, in assessing these, we randomize these and we look at spectra, which is quite logic and common knowledge. These spectra are mostly look, where we mostly look at are uh, caution, these waves are caution. However, what my previous research looked at is that as these sea states evolve, we see different phenomena occurring within the waves. So we see the waves becoming more steep and we see them also becoming uh, changing in terms of groupiness, which is typically what you would see due to uh, Benjamin fear instability. And because of that, indeed, we get bigger waves and we get, um, and we get uh, differently grouped, uh, grouped waves, as well as some, some changes in our frequency content. And basically at the time, the question of this exercise was basically to look at what happens to a structure if you would uh, submit them to this random sea state which has ev have evolved, which is something we normally don't look at for several reasons, mainly because it's quite expensive to do this exercise while properly taking into account wave structure interaction phenomena. So in order to initially tackle uh, some of the challenges related to generating a large amount of data, using quite demanding models. Um, I adopted a domain decom uh, decomposition. Methodology is, is actually that um, in order to model the large distance needed for the wave wave interactions to occur, we use the HOS numerical wave tank to then apply these, um, to then apply the waves generated in HOS uh, to the CFD model. So basically what happens is that we look we go two wavelengths back, we um, post -pr uh, process the data we get from the HOS model and we apply them at the beginning of a near field solver in CFD. At the time it was open foam. In doing so, uh, we got quite, um, quite some data. However, this strategy was still uh, quite demanding. Um, also, I think most of the present strategies would be very demanding still, because yeah, indeed you need a large amount of data to look into these kind of problems. Based on this strategy, I actually, um, yeah, I did a few benchmarks, of course. So I basically benchmarked first what happens uh, if I applied the, the loads from the previous slide. So the one uh, at the, the dashed line, 
uh, compared with the loads I, I would normally get at the location of the monopile. And what you could see is that you get a, a very nice uh, correspondence between HOS and COD, if, albeit uh, a few uh, differences, which at the time I found to be, um, to some extent, especially the small offset you see here, to some extent uh, being due to the difference in grids. But indeed, you see that both work very great if you, if you look at them. I also uh, looked at what happens in terms of uh, the loads acting on the structure. To this extent, I used an, uh, an industry standard uh, BAM solver, Hydrostar, and I compared it with what I got from uh, CFD. And if you look at this, indeed, you get also a night correspondence. I also looked what happened if I added uh, different uh, second order uh, contributions. I see that after, indeed, uh, about 500 seconds, I get a little bit more of uh, discrepancy between both models, albeit them actually corresponding quite well. But the difference is basically also occur at the time when I get more steep waves. So I expect that um, the BAM solver at that point was not entirely adequate anymore to model this. So in um, applying this strategy, I found some initial response statistics, however, at a large computational time. Um, from these, uh, from these um, first results you see on the top, you, you see the waves. So basically, um, yeah, on the left, you see, yeah, I cannot see the entire screen actually, yeah. Okay. So on the top, uh, you see the waves um, for three different realizations, actually, from uh, the Benjamin fear instability. The blue one being very small, where you normally would not expect anything. The orange one, you would corresponds to a gamma equal to 3.3, and the, the green one corresponding to a gamma of 6. But if you look at these results, you see indeed that um, the wave change uh, with distance. However, if you then look also uh, to the bottom, you also see something happening here. However, there's not much you can say of these graphs, of course, because yeah, what can you actually believe if you look to these details? So there's clearly not enough data at this point. And because of that, um, I had to found, find actually a bit of a strategy to deal with this and uh, get more data at an acceptable cost. So what I did, um, what I did was I adopted a system identification uh, strategy, which is quite typical uh, in offshore engineering, and I um, I took the data I got from uh, the data I got from the previous exercise, and I used them to identify um, the system. Uh, entirely taking along uh, phenomena until second order. So basically I solved the least square problem um, as defined by Kim and Powers. And in doing so, I managed to uh, set up a system that could then do an approximation of course, and also taking into account the range of applicability um, of the waves. Um, I could actually define a system that had some quite nice, um, quite nice performance. So if I compare, if I look to the convergence, so co uh, coherence, I see that at the peak natural, at the peak frequency of the wave spectrum, which was about uh, at 10 seconds, you see that there's quite, um, quite good coherence between the data from the CFDs, so from the previous exercise and uh, the data generated um, through the system identification. Um, the same can be said for uh, the natural frequency of the structure, which was about 0.253 Hertz. So if you then look to the right, you see that indeed there's a nice correspondence using the same waves, uh, but on the one hand using the CFD, on the other hand, um, yeah, the identified system, but basically what people would now to some extent, maybe call a digital twin, but in its more rudimentary form. Then I um, used this uh, model 
um, with for more realizations of the wave of the same wave spectrum. So basically, I run more simulations in HOS, which can indeed be done quite fast. And um, as a result, I see that um, I saw that um, looking at response statistics, that there were some very uh, very clear. Uh, things to see. So on the top, you see the waves. On the left, you see um, the wave spectrum. So the wave field as generated at the beginning of the wave flume about two wavelengths into the HOS, the medical wave tank. Then on the second one, I see the same, but after 20 wavelengths. And on the right, just for comparison, I also added the same the second order ways. So basically what would happen if you have bound components in your um, wave field. From this, um, yeah, um, the, the, yeah, actually maybe I should say this as well. The dashed line is basically uh, the typhoon distribution and um, the, the full line is uh, the Gaussian distribution. And if I then apply that to my identified system, I see several things. So for the um, structure at the, uh, theoretically placed uh, at the beginning of the wave flume. So basically, if you would have the waves at two wavelengths impact from the wave maker impacting on your structure, you see that there's already some differences here, however, not quite clear. If you then adopt the waves at 20 uh, wavelengths from the wave maker, you see something happen. It's the fact that you get more um, motion um, in the direction of um, in the direction of uh, the the waves, as well as on the other side the response of the waves. You see that the tails become quite quite heavy. If you compare that with uh, the bound second order waves, it's clear that this does not respond, this does not explain what's, um, what's happening with the structure. So you see that there's quite a big response just in just random, random waves. The same we see in, um, the same we see if we plot uh, the extremes. So on the upper um, on the upper parts of the page, you see again two wavelengths from the wave maker, 20, and again for uh, for comparison, uh, the second order waves. And you see that in the beginning, indeed, there is some more uh, extreme response, mainly for the broadbanded spectrum. So you see this especially for the blue dots. However, if we look further on. Um, and apply waves towards the end of the wave spectrum. So random waves which have gotten the chance to evolve, we see that um, something changes. And especially we see that the blue dots remain approximately where they are, but the, the, um, the Johns Hopkins spectrum 3.3, gamma 3.3 and the very narrow banded spectrum, both give some very big uh, extremes, which are If you compare that to, um, to the second order waves, you see that indeed this does not, this cannot be explained. So there's a clear influence that we can see um, in the random waves if we generate them just uh, random numerically or um, let them evolve over distance. And I think especially over, um, especially for monopiles in uh, exposed locations, this is something uh, that we cannot ignore. So basically going then back from the academic part to the industry practice, there's a few things uh, that need to be highlighted. The first one is that our turbines are getting larger and they are already fully at their limits. And indeed, we are working in more exposed areas. So it is reasonable to expect that the wave loads in the random sea states could be underestimated, which is, in my opinion, quite a problem. Of course, we also have, um, we also have still um, some, um, some safety factors there. However, if you look to the extent that I showed a few slides back, that um, I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile to have a closer look.
So I really indeed think that further research should further look into this, as well as maybe also look uh, a bit above second order and see also what's happening there due to these effects. Okay, I think I might be a bit fast, but uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and I would like to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Great. Great. Yeah. Uh, let's see the chat. There are some questions. <laughs> oh, but yes, for the from the previous talk. And any question from Greed? To Greed? Probably Paolo. Hi. I have one. <clears throat> Can you back, go back to a couple of slides, uh -huh. please? With the distribution, yeah, this one, or yeah. the one before, it's the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're telling me that the, the first column is what you do with, because I got lost, with HOS yeah. and, and yes, or did, CFD. Yeah. Yes, okay. so uh, the, the top, yeah, the top was, uh, was the waves coming from HOS. First I did then the CFD, but I didn't get enough data. So what I then did, okay. basically, yeah. You don't have plume data. It's, it's only numerical. This is only numerical, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. But in, nice. in, in case of the waves, the waves basically that's that's a bit of similar kind of research that has been done. Uh, I, I lost the audio. Okay. Uh, okay, but so the wave maker is the numerical wave maker. You're telling me yes, you don't have yes. a physical wave maker. And then I got lost with the with the second order system. The second yeah. order system is just a, a BAM translated to second order with a second order filter, something uh, like this. Yeah, but basically I went. Yeah, basically I used the data we got from uh, from the CFD. So based on yeah data from the CFD and applied there um, and applied there uh, this. Um, the Kim and power zone so that I got first and second order. But basically, yeah, it's it should be able to take into a, into account uh, the, uh, some of the non gaussianity as well. Yeah. Okay, because my, mm. my, my question is is that if you are close to the wave maker or away mm. from the wave maker, then if it is uh, an FFT space, you, you shouldn't see any anything different, right? Um, the but only uh, the only thing that I can yeah. I can think about is about the the boundary condition that you are imposing to the wave maker, which at the beginning close to the wave maker, it's close to the to the Jones swap thing that you think you are imposing to the water, but then when you're away from the wave maker, you don't have the Jones swap anymore. So no, no indeed. Motion. No, indeed, yeah. but that's indeed so, what's, so I'm using the HOS. It's not the same wave that you, you, you have on the No, it's not, it's not the same, it's not it's exactly the same wave. I'm using the HOS no. numerical wave tank and the waves actually get a chance to evolve over distance. So basically that's what's happening. And then I get uh, the spectrum from that and I recompose the spectrum to add to the CFD. Um, basically that was the first exercise I did but that's very costly to do and still very costly to do to, to look at random waves. Yeah, I... So um, then I used um, the second order system to actually uh, approximate what I did in the CFD. And then I applied it to the same exercise in HOS, numerical what wave I... tank, yeah. What I think is that the second order mm -hmm. is more correct than what, than what you do on the HOS. <laughs> It's I, I don't know, but it's kind of pa Paolo. Sorry, there no, but I'm sorry. Stuff. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. But, but it's very interesting. Too. Time is running, so sorry. yeah, there is one one question. Yes, in the chat, probably Grit, you can take it. Ah, uh, yes. On your own, because you can read it, and then Gigi Cavallari here uh, has a question too. Uh, yeah. So it is a lambda p over uh, over d ratio for the overlap area. Yes. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the lambda p, yeah. To be honest, I would need to look that up. Um, okay. But maybe I can take another question and I come back to that afterwards. Is that okay with you, Alfiso? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Have a Gigi here. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Very good. Very good presentation. And uh, 
also the one by Guillaume Fox. I had a question. Uh, it's a comment rather than a question. Yeah. Uh, both uh, you and Guillaume are discussing at a very high sophistication level how the wave behave and how they impact. However, um, as uh, we discussed uh, many years ago in Trondheim, uh, real C is quite different. I'm, uh, I'm commenting both on you and Guillaume, previous lecture. Guillaume was showing 10 meter waves uh, and these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, uh, when uh, waves are coming against your pile, there is wind. And a windy sea is quite different from uh, whatever you can calculate with the first, second, or nonlinear system with these sort of things. So how do you keep that into account? Because of course, you, uh, Guillaume could ignore that because it is a wave tank, but you work on a wind farm. So wind is part of your game. <laughs> Well, for this, this exercise was indeed basically idling conditions, which for wind turbines we have seen to be quite damaging, especially costing us a, a lot of lifetime. Maybe Guillaume, you should take the question regarding uh, the winds impacting in your model. Uh, yeah, thanks Luigi. I, I remember the discussion we had uh, with this exact same topic in Fondheim. But uh, exactly. yeah, I, I, perfect, I perfectly agree that uh, the model that is developed is really only dedicated to nonlinear wave propagation on that. In the sea, we might have some significant difference in uh, some conditions, but what I would state is that uh, the approach is also, I would say, strongly related to the regulations that for now imposes uh, some uh, rules, classification society like DNV, uh, Bureau Veritas or Lloyd's, they are telling you, okay, you uh, you take into account the the waves because this is the most important stuff. To check it, you go in a tank. So at least we try uh, to be able to reproduce what's happening in a tank. But I agree that the next step is really to try to go to something uh, closer to what's happening in the uh, real ocean. Okay. But Thank this you. is a message that you should send to DNV or or yeah. BV or whatever uh, classification society, I think. But, uh, but I agree that this is a very Thanks important point. Yeah. Great, if you have time to, there's mm. yes, a couple of minutes to to answer the question on the chat, if you yes, uh, want okay. to answer now, or you can uh, I, later. I need to look up the Lambda P myself, to be honest. Maybe, okay. in, uh, yeah, but maybe, yeah, can you share the system identification publication if available? Yeah, that's a good question. That's something I've I'm, I'm been working on for a few months now. So I expect to publish this uh, uh, beginning, of, uh, of next, beginning of next year. Um, I see another from Paolo, maybe um, uh, statistics are known to evolve in yep. space. Yes, indeed. I think I answered that question, Paolo, or is a new one? No, no. Yeah, but okay. we will talk with Guillaume later. No problem. Okay. And with you <laughs> yeah. also about that. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And then some of the other questions. Yeah, indeed. Again, uh, it's not. Yeah, the chat is a bit confusing for me. Uh, the paper based on implementation. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. there are no okay. more questions in the chat, and the audience. Yeah. Uh, no more. Yeah. I think that we are perfect in time, so yeah. we can. Uh, I think concluded this uh, seminar. Mm -hmm. We really thank the two speakers, Grit and uh, Guyan, for this uh, a great, uh, great seminar, and then mm -hmm. to the next uh, wise meeting. Okay, Bye. thank you. Thanks.